Amen. It's so good to see you. If you have your Bible or your Bible app, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 11. We are continuing in our sermon series called The Son of God. And so for the rest of 2022, we'll be in the Gospel of Luke preaching and teaching a sermon series called The Son of God. Now, if you don't have a Bible with you, you're invited to use one of the Bibles under the seats in front of you. And you will find Luke chapter 11 on page 1033. And as always, if you don't have a Bible that you could read or understand easily, please take one of our Bibles home with you. It is our gift to you. We want you to have a copy of the Word of God, read the Word of God, and apply it to your life. We are firmly convinced that if we read and apply God's Word, He will transform our lives. And if you're watching online right now and you don't have a Bible, email us and let us know. Reach out to somebody on social media. We will get a Bible in your hands hands. We give away Bibles every weekend because we see the power that's there, the power of transformation found in God's Word. Uh, last weekend, my family and I visited a what we're calling a micro campus in Minnesota. And we uh, flipped jet skis. We got sunburned. I had to travel to Minnesota to get a sunburn. I live in Arizona, right? It doesn't make sense, but we had an amazing time. It was awesome. Uh, we stayed with Jeff and Kathy Gilbert's uh, house and the cherry on top as we had about 24 people gathered together for worship in their living room was to be able to walk out to their lake in their backyard and have these eight people express their faith in Jesus by being baptized. Isn't this awesome? Oh, the picture's here somewhere. I thought it was behind me the whole time. There it is. Let's, and since you weren't there, let's celebrate with these, this family and let's celebrate with them and just give them a round of applause for being baptized last weekend. It was pretty amazing. Uh, I have been in, in ministry for about 20, almost 25 years now, and I've noticed that there is one common denominator, whether I'm in a room filled with men or women or children or students, deacons, church staff, it doesn't matter. There is one common denominator. Everybody can be talking, everyone can be chatting, everybody can be cutting up, but the moment somebody says, who wants to open us up in prayer? Everybody gets quiet. Nobody stands up and says, I'll, I'll volunteer, I will pray, I'll open us up in prayer. Everyone gets quiet, eyes go to the ground, people are looking around, please don't look at me, please don't look at me. Some people have been followers of Jesus for a very long time and they have never prayed in public. I want you to know that's okay. Uh, if that's you, it's okay. You don't have to pray out loud. You don't have to pray in public to be loved by God. God loves you just exactly the way that you are. Uh, according to research that's done year after year after year, the number one fear that Americans face is speaking in public. And the second fear in America is death. So I'm sorry, the number one fear is death. The second fear is speaking in public. And that means people would rather die than speak in public. People would rather die often than pray in public. Just a couple months after I had surrendered my life to Jesus, I was a young kid, I was 18 years old. Uh, about two months into attending church, I was uh, going to church on Sunday nights and there was a group of about 50 to 60 people there in this little church in Tennessee. And the pastor would often end his Sunday night message with uh, an invitation or, or to just voluntarily ask somebody to pray. So he would close up, he would wrap up his message and he'd look around and say, brother or so-and-so, would you close us out in prayer? And they would stand up and they would close us out in prayer and we were dismissed. Well, I was clowning around. I wasn't paying attention the entire message. I was messing with my friend and we were being stupid and silly. And we got to the point where he was closing it down and I could have sworn he said, brother Joe, will you close us out in prayer? My heart started racing. I began to panic and I stood up and I prayed. 
the worst thing happened was he didn't call on me to pray. <laughs> and to make it even more awkward, people came up to me afterwards and said, wow, what a wonderful prayer. Congratulations on that prayer. Like it couldn't have been any more awkward. It was just weird. So I, I like group participation. You know that about me. I like it when you guys get involved a little bit. So would you do me a favor by raising your hand? If you have a fear of speaking in public, would you raise your hand? Now come up here on the stage and tell us why. <laughs> raise your hand. So raise your hand if you prefer to keep quiet in public. Would you raise your hand? All right. Now raise your hand if you would prefer your spouse stays quiet in public. <laughs> Some of y'all, you just got to learn. In today's passage, the disciples, the followers of Jesus, recognized that there was something significant about Jesus' prayer life. Uh, they recognized that Jesus had a prayer life unlike anything that they had ever seen. And on this occasion, after Jesus had been praying to God, the disciples turned to Jesus. One of the disciples turned to Jesus and said, Lord, would you teach us how to pray like you? And then in Luke chapter 11, Jesus gave them what is known today as uh, something that we call the Lord's Prayer. Or if you grew up Catholic or if you're a former Catholic, you know the Lord's Prayer as the bead that comes after the 10 Hail Marys and the rosary. If you're Catholic, you just understood that. Jesus didn't teach them uh, the model prayer or how to model the prayer. He taught them crucial principles about prayer. He, he taught them some principles in this passage that every one of us need to apply to our lives. And if your prayer life has felt empty recently, uh, if you feel like uh, you're really, your relationship with God has really kind of gone down the tubes, it's my prayer today that this message would kind of reignite a desire in your heart to pray and to talk with God. So let's read together Luke chapter 11 on page 1033. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, which of you has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, Yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish, give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, if you're like me, as you read this passage of scripture, it feels like Jesus was just waiting for a moment to unload all this truth on his disciples. It was like he was, he's been waiting for three years for one of, them, one of them to say, Lord, teach us how to pray. And Jesus just, I mean, he unloaded on them. Not only did he give them words to pray, but then he talked about the position of their prayer and the attitudes of their hearts. He gave them powerful, life-changing advice. 
What I like about this passage is Jesus didn't tell them to close their eyes, bow their head, fold their hands, and pray. Every evening as we, as we pray over our dinner and we're, we show God thanks together as a family, when we pray together, I wait for the girls to close their eyes, to bow their heads, to fold their hands, to stop petting the dog, to stop playing on their phones, to stop eating. I invite them to, hey, let's close our eyes, let's bow our heads and pray. Jesus didn't mention anything about their physical attributes whatsoever. Jesus wasn't concerned about how they prayed. He wasn't concerned whether or not people closed their eyes or raised their hands or knelt down. The thing that mattered the most to Jesus what was, is what was taking place in their hearts. What mattered to Jesus was the experience that these men had in their relationship with God. He emphasized the experience of prayer. And one of the first things that we see in this passage is that the heart of prayer is uncomfortable grace. The heart of prayer is uncomfortable grace grace. Take a look again at verse four. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Now for more clarity, in case that's a little bit confusing, the New Living Translation says this, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Jesus taught us that at the very core of our conversation with God is an attitude that offers uncomfortable grace to those around us. When we pray to God and ask God to forgive us our sins, we must be willing to forgive those people who sin against us us. And have you ever noticed it's not necessarily strangers that really offend us. It's not strangers that hurt us. It's not strangers that rub us the wrong way. Now, street strangers, people that we don't know, they very may they very they may very well sin against us. But they don't hurt us like those that we trust. Strangers don't hurt us like those that we love. It's often those that we love the most that hurt us the most. It's often those that love us the most or that we love the most, those that we admire, those that we trust, family members and friends, those are the ones that we often have a hard time forgiving. Examine your own life to see if I'm, uh, see if I'm uh, just blowing hot air. Look at your own life and think about the people that you've held grudges against in the past. Are they strangers or are they people close to you? Are, are they people that you loved and cared for or are they people that you hardly even knew? See, it's not the people that cut us off in traffic that offend us the most. It's not the people that cut us out, out in line at the grocery store or repeatedly call us on our cell phones. It's the people that we love and we trust and we admire, the people that we hold in high regard. When they sin against us, that's what usually wounds us deeply. And when trust is broken, it can wound us for a very long time. But here's the beautiful thing. It is only when you and I are wounded, it is only when our trust is broken that we get to join with Jesus in demonstrating grace to those who don't deserve it. See, it's only when we're hurt that we get to live like Jesus. We get to demonstrate grace to those who do not deserve it. It's only when we're hurt that we get to radiate the beautiful, overwhelming kindness and love of God. 
So when was the last time that you demonstrated uncomfortable grace in your conversations with God? When was the last time that you said to God, God, I forgive this person for the hurt that they've caused in my life? Because Jesus is saying, pray like this, forgive us our sins just like we forgive those who sin against us. Forgive me just like I forgive other people. When was the last time when you were alone and you were in the presence of God that you released your hurt, you released your anger, you released that grudge that you felt against that person that hurt you? You might say, Pastor, you don't understand. They don't deserve to be forgiven. I agree. They do not deserve to be forgiven and neither do you and neither do I. See, we can't earn our forgiveness from God and we do not deserve his forgiveness for our rebellion against him. Each of us in this room, we have thought evil thoughts. Uh, we have cheated, we have lied, we have lusted. We have lived in open rebellion against our creator, God. We've harbored grudges, we've harbored bitterness. And it's because of our rebellion, it's because of our sin, we are separated from God and we do not deserve his forgiveness. The Bible tells us in Romans 6, 23, that the wages of sin is death. Wages is something that you and I earned for doing something. If you earn a wage at work, it's yours, you deserve it. The Bible teaches us that what you and I deserve, what we have earned for living in rebellion against God is death. We do not deserve forgiveness. 1 Peter 3, 18, though, the Bible tells us that Christ suffered once for our sins, the just for the unjust, so he can bring us to God. He was put to death in the flesh and he was made alive by the spirit. The reason why Jesus paid the price for, uh, for you and I on the cross was to pay our debt, to pay our wage, to pay what we have earned. Christ died on the cross so that you and I can be forgiven. And if you're a believer in Jesus and you've already surrendered your life to him, you have been brought safely home to God. You are wrapped up in his presence in prayer. And as you enter into God's presence in prayer, bring that same attitude of uncomfortable grace that you want God to show to you Bring that same attitude toward others. As God wraps you up in his presence, as God surrounds you with his joy and with his light, make sure you're not living your life that while God is embracing you, you're sticking your tongue out at somebody else. As you are wrapped up in God's presence, you're not looking at other people like, na, 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 na because that's what it's like if we go to God receiving forgiveness for our sins, but not willing to demonstrate forgiveness to other people. That's called uncomfortable grace, showing grace to those who don't deserve it. And if you've not yet surrendered your life to Jesus, I've got great news for you. Our prayer team is gonna be here at the close of the service. After the last song is played, they'll be lined up here along the front. They would love to talk to you about what it means to surrender your life to Jesus. And if you're harboring grudges and if you're harboring hurt and if you're harboring unforgiveness, let me encourage you, come down and talk to them and say, will you pray for me so that I can forgive others? A second thing that we learn about prayer from this passage is that persistence in prayer demonstrates faith. Persistence in prayer demonstrates faith. Now, I've heard people tell me this before. They say things like, well, I asked God to free me from this addiction and he never did, so he must not love me enough to answer my prayer. 
Or they sit across from me in marriage counseling and they say, I asked God to help us with our marriage, but he hasn't. God must not love me enough or love us enough to answer our prayer. See, if you want God to do something big in your life, you must be persistent in your prayer life. You must be persistent in the ask. Whatever it is, you have to be persistent in it. Is it really important to you? Do you really want God to bring healing? Do you really want God to rescue? Then be persistent in your prayer. Uh, this story that Jesus told about prayer is awesome. Which of you as a friend uh, will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has ar arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, don't bother me. The door is now shut. I'm in bed with my kids, go away. But because the guy won't go away, because he continues to knock, because he continues to pound on the door, and because he continues to ask the question, will you please give me loaves of bread? The man will get up and go answer the door. He didn't want to get out of bed. He did not want to answer the door. The other man refused to go away. And can I just tell you something? That would be obnoxious. Can you imagine somebody showing up to your door at midnight and knocking on the door while you are asleep and not going away? Nowadays, we just look at our smartphone, right? And we press a button and say, hey, go away. <laughs> and talk to him through the Ring app on our phone. It was obnoxious. We would call the police if somebody showed up on our doorstep like that and refused to go away, or we might take other drastic measures. Jesus is teaching us today, it is okay for you and I to be obnoxious in prayer. It is okay for you and I to be persistent in our prayer. It is okay for you and I to be repetitive and to be obnoxious and to be persistent. Every day as a father of four children, a 14-year-old, a 13-year-old, 11-year-old, a 9-year-old, I, daughters, I am reminded, I am reminded of persistence in prayer. Dad, can I have this? Dad, can I do that? Dad, can I do this? If I say no, they ask me again. And if I say no, they keep on asking me. Dad, can I have this? Dad, can I please have this? Dad, oh dad, please, please, please. Father, Padre, will you please let me do this? It's exasperating. If you feel what I'm saying, say, help me, Jesus. <laughs> Persistence in prayer is a sign that we really believe God is a good God. Persistence in prayer is a sign that we really do believe God loves us and God will answer our prayer. Persistence in prayer is not only a sign of faith, it is a command that needs to be obeyed. We should not as followers of Jesus be one and done in our praying. If it really matters to you, Jesus said, keep on asking. Be persistent in your prayer. And finally, we see the third principle that Jesus wanted his disciples to understand and he wants you and I to understand today. God is good and he wants to bless you. So ask, seek, and knock. Luke eleven thirteen, 13, Jesus said, so if you sinful people, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? I, I want you to repeat after me, God is good and wants to bless me. God is good and wants to bless me. Now, number one, first and foremost, he wants to bless you with the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. 
I mean, that's, that is what we see here in Jesus, Jesus' teaching on prayer. That it's because he's good, he wants you and I to experience the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit living within us. Not around us, not at church, but that he wants us to experience the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit on the inside. When you surrender your life to Jesus and you receive forgiveness for your sins and you make a commitment to follow Christ for the rest of your life, the Bible says you are changed. The Bible says you are born again. The Bible says you have received the spirit of the Lord in your life. That's because God is good. If God wasn't good, he wouldn't give you the Holy Spirit. If God wasn't good, he wouldn't change you from the inside out. If God wasn't good, he wouldn't give you forgiveness for your sins. If God wasn't good, Jesus would not have paid the price for our sins on the cross. But it's because God is good, he has demonstrated his love for us. And while we were yet sinners, Jesus gave his life up for us. And when we commit and surrender our lives to Jesus, we received the Holy Spirit on the inside. We are made new. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God lives in you? That's actually called a new identity. That's actually called your new life in Christ. And if you're interested in learning more about your new identity, that's the theme for this year's Summer Life Series. This Tuesday night, right here in this room, our pastors are going to begin talking about what our new life in Christ looks like. What is this new identity that you and I have? And how does the Holy Spirit play a part in that? If you've not yet signed up, if you're interested in learning more about your new identity, come this Tuesday night. I'm gonna be kicking off the, the series. I'm excited about it. Come and be a part of it. You will regret it, regret it if you're not there. I'd love for you to be a part of it this Tuesday. So as a follower of Jesus, how will you demonstrate that you really believe that God is good? Ask, seek, knock, be persistent in your prayer because you believe, you know, God is good. So be obnoxious in your prayer life. Keep on asking God. Don't give up. If something is significant to you, if something is important to you, if you really want God to work in your marriage, if you really want God to work in your relationships, if you really want God to rescue you from addictions or sin or whatever it is that you struggle with, if you really want God to set you free and he hasn't done it yet, Keep going to him. Keep asking him. Keep requesting it of him. Keep asking God to set you free. Keep asking God to deliver you. Keep asking God to restore your marriage, restore relationships, mend the relationships with your children. Keep asking God for what's important to you because that is where our faith is demonstrated. That is where it's clear to the Lord God, we do believe he is good because he's the only one that can answer our prayer and he's the only one that we can turn to. As we close out in prayer, I wanted to invite you. I thought it would be uh, kind of cool, if you will. Many of us have probably learned the Lord's Prayer at some point in our lives. Many of us have learned that model prayer, whether maybe you had it memorized as a child, or maybe it's something that you learned after coming to faith in Christ. But I thought it would be a, a neat thing for us to do as a church family. Let's stand together. And if you know it by heart, that's great. Let's recite the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Father, we love you. Be glorified in our worship. Be glorified in our prayer life. Be glorified in our lives and help us to genuinely demonstrate uncomfortable grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.